Hello, hello. How are we? Uh, how's the weekend? How'd your team go? How your tips go? Uh, my response to both of those questions is absolutely fucking terrible, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, there's some, some results. A few, a few teams continue to fall by the wayside. Some teams continue on the up. Um, and then there's some, some other mixed results uh, in the bag there as well. So uh, look, let's have a look at the NRL ladder as it stands as of the, the last game of the round just finished between Manly and the Tigers. So your top eight is the Dragons, still undefeated, the only undefeated team. So we've, we've got one team that's um, undefeated and one team who's still winless in, in Parramatta. So Dragons, Penrith, Warriors, Tigers, Melbourne Storm, Roosters, Rabbitohs, Broncos into the eight now. And uh, just outside the eight, you have the Titans, uh, Knights, Manly, Raiders, Sharks, Bulldogs, Cowboys, Eels. So, yeah, again, the, the winless Parramatta Eels. So, yeah, where, where's your team sit on there? Uh, mine's sitting fucking second last in the Cowboys. Um, and, yeah, I'm not going to harp on about them just yet. Uh, we'll no doubt get to that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to go around in circles. Let's dive straight into things, gang. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, Thursday night footy uh, in the first upset for the round. Uh, the Rabbitohs 26 over the Roosters 16. Look, it definitely, like I just said, is a result that I don't think many people would have seen coming. Um, I guess the, the form that we've seen so far from the Roosters, everyone knows the expectation around the, the 17 that go on the pitch for them every week. And, and I guess that is why, and, and more so the fact that the Rabbitohs were missing um, Burgess and Cam Murray, who have been so good at tightening up the middle for them. Uh, so, yeah, thoroughly, thoroughly disappointing for the Roosters. Um, they just couldn't really get going. Uh, there was times and periods where where they did gain a fair bit of consistency, but, but just couldn't uh, make that last pass stick. But hats off to the, the Rabbitohs. Um, obviously going into a game, as I just said, with, without their, their uh, strongest middle so far this season, um, the, the pressure was on them to perform. And, geez, didn't they go out and do that? Uh, Tom Burgess probably had the best game that he's had in, in four years since they won the comp back in 2014, in, in my opinion. So, um, you know, we, we go through, through some of the stats um, yeah, Tommy Burgess there with 181 run metres, and it sort of tells the tale for, for the Roosters there. Their uh, leading uh, metre reader was, was James Tedesco with 187, and, and that's mainly because he's just bringing it out of trouble all the time. So, yeah, look, a, a little bit disappointing. I, I found that um, they really targeted Ryan Madison really well and, and got under the young kid's skin um, a fair bit, and and that really started to free up his relationship with defending his half on the edge, and 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 they had success with that. So um, interesting to see now how the performance of uh, the the rookie coaches that have come into the comp and how these teams are forming. I think it's a pretty fair indication. Um, both both or well, every single team, uh, whether it be the Bulldogs, the Titans, um, or the Rabbitohs, they've they've sort of been a little bit inconsistent. So. Something to build on, and, and no doubt once once uh, jo uh, George Burgess, uh, George Burgess, Sam Burgess is back in the fray next weekend. Uh, there's going to be bigger and better things to, to come for them. So yeah, as far as as uh, the Roosters are concerned, it, it's pretty much back back to the drawing board. Um, you know, you look at the stats, and it was pretty well split down the middle. It's not that the Roosters didn't really um, have their opportunities at times; they just didn't capitalise. You know, we see there um, 17 offloads for the Rabbitohs. Uh, so second phase footy, that's what's going to start to gas you out. Um, so yeah, not not really too much more more to say other than hats off to the Rabbitohs. Um, Dane Cook having a, another great game, and and that's what happens when we say it every week. And it, it's just basic rugby league. If your forwards lay that foundation in the middle and, and win the middle, it, it allows you to play to your edges. If you try and do it, things the opposite. Um, unless you have some freakish talent or some poor defence that you're you're playing against, uh, it, it very rarely works. Uh, so yeah, hats off to the middle uh, for the for the Rabbitohs for standing up and, and taking on. You know, it's it's not like Dylan Arpa really had a shocker. I thought he played fantastic as well. But uh, yeah, it was just the overwhelming uh, volume that they continue to, to play with. And John Sutton probably had one of his best game in years as well. He was absolutely dynamic, and it's great to see the passion that sort of comes out in someone 
who's been playing for a club that long and uh, yeah, getting their, their just desserts. On to the next game. Well, didn't uh, didn't we start to see some of the Melbourne storm that we come to expect in this this season of, of 2018 post Cronk? Um, Melbourne Storm going on to beat Newcastle 40 points to 14. Uh, the big question around uh, the Melbourne Storm was how was um, Riley Jacks going to perform as the, the new seven after Brodie Croft got uh, dropped back to the East Tigers back in the Queensland Cup. Uh, and look, he, he, answered, he answered the call really well. One thing that I've always really, really liked about Jacks is his direct play. It's it's a key feature of his game that that he brings no matter what level of footy he's playing at, uh, and and it just helps relieve so much pressure on his outside runners. Uh, I think that's what what playing square at the line does most, it, and it also holds up defenders on the inside. It can't allow them to just release straight off, and that first twenty minutes pretty much laid the platform. Um, I, gallant as the Knights were to, to fight back. You know, they scored those two tries within within 10 minutes before half time to really make it interesting. But, you know, we've seen um, three three tries in that first 20 minutes. Um, and then you, you had that penalty goal in there as well. It, it was just a little bit too much too soon. And I don't think that Newcastle, just with where they're at at the moment, with the, the age of their pack, um, that they were able to just wrestle that momentum back and having still the experience within some of the forwards that the Melbourne Storm do have in the likes of both the Bromwiches now, you can call experienced forwards, um, Glasby uh, they, and Hoffman, they, they were always able to sort of, you know, if, if they started playing a little bit too lateral, things started to come unstuck a little and get a little bit funky, uh, they could always just draw things back and, and get back to those basic Melbourne Storm structures, which they're so well-renowned for. Um, but again, you know, hats off to um, the Newcastle Knights for for coming back and, and making a contest of it. But it, but it was pretty much a, a case of um, continuity, you know, just getting back to what the Melbourne Storm know that they are capable of. And the biggest plus for them was improving their completion rates. Um, their completions in the last two weeks have been around 65%. And to get that up to 87%, completing 33 or 38 sets, um, not, not that Newcastle were terrible, 78%, completing 25 of 32. Uh, but the big big difference was just time in possession, 27 and a half minutes um, in favour of just under 20 minutes. So, you know, if you're giving a, a team like the Melbourne Storm seven more minutes with a footy, um, you know, that's essentially seven sets of six that, that you're sitting back. And, and that's just back, almost what the difference was, six sets um, more in favour of, of the Melbourne Storm. Um, I think... Overall, we're starting to see the the tactics of uh, the penalties being given away start to, to come out in, in different sites. And I've been having this discussion with a lot of my mates um, across the weekend. You know, some people are very firm and be like, well, you can't complain when the referee's doing his job, he's buying penalties, and then you get sent to the bin. Um, you either have to change or it's going to keep happening. And I think you're seeing some teams that are, are happy to be like, okay, fuck, send us to the bin. We'll back ourselves. Uh, when we've seen a few teams that have had players sent to the bin uh, and they haven't actually leaked points after that. So uh, it, it's going to depend where the game is at, where your season's at. Um, you know, someone like the Cowboys, as, as will example, can't, be, can't afford to do that. They, they can't afford to have the yield discipline. Uh, but... You know, if you're playing from in front, fuck, you, you do whatever you want. Secure the line. Put the pressure on the opposition. So, you know, in, interesting times in rugby league at the moment. I think the game is really in a transitionary period um, around the way it is being uh, ruled upon. And uh, Andrew Voss made a really interesting uh, call on air today uh, about how the game's slowing down when the referee is going to talk to the captain about, uh, you know, being multiple penalties in a row. Uh, for for the same infringement that the next player is going to get sin bin. Uh, he was saying that the Super League used just it's just a hand signal from the referee uh, to to indicate that basically the next one's gone. We, why do we need to stop the game? Because the whole idea of giving these penalties um, to the team in the in the first place is to give them an advantage because defensively, the, the that team in defence has been looking for the advantage by slowing down the ruck. So by you talking to the captain of the defensive team, you're actually playing into the hands of what they're trying to achieve which is really counterintuitive. So 
yeah, I, I really hope that that starts to change. Uh, on to the next game, uh, the the Dragons and the Sharks. This was probably my my favourite game of the weekend, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I know a lot of people would probably disagree with me simply because of um, the errors and penalties. So we, we see in total 29 errors throughout the whole game and, and 23 penalties um, and, and a sin bin in there as well for good measure. But outside of those stoppages, and I know that there was um, a number of, of penalty goals early on as well, so we've seen four in total, and that's, that's again, a tactic of a team that that's, has a winning culture at the moment in the Dragons. They're, they're definitely kicking themselves into uh, dominant positions. Um, but, yeah, the, outside of those stoppages, the game was played at such a high intensity, such a fast pace. And just to see those forward packs, you know, on paper, uh, they, they are, are, they're they up there with the likes of the Melbourne Storms forward pack when they were fully fit, the Cowboys forward packs when they were fully fit. The big difference between this Dragons forward pack and the rest is that they're actually fucking performing. Um, but, yeah, how about some of the individual efforts? Uh, I think, again, we're seeing that word come up in, in describing this this dragon side uh, in contrast. Uh, the likes of Dufty with his individual brilliance. Um, Cameron McInnes, much the same in his try. But then you had the likes of like Paul, Paul Vaughan and Jack DeBellin. That's just fucking ticker. And then just out and out skill and utilization of someone like you and Aitken. And I, it was unfortunate to see injuries to, to key players like Gallon, Fafita, who was abs- having an absolute fucking blinder, um, and then Wade Graham as well, to, to see the the Sharks reduce to that um, one man on the bench and still be competitive. You know, after that, we've still seen Valentine Holmes and Ricky Latelli score, and then compound that with the fact that if Josh Dugan, you know, it, it's pretty unlucky that Valentine Holmes got a hand to that ball. If that changes... All of a sudden, I, th- I believe it would have been a 28-20 or something like that, or 28-22. Um, yeah, and, and then then it's game on. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're the little little contest, the, I guess, bits of luck, uh, for lack of a better term, that just aren't quite going the Sharks' way. Um, I didn't watch the post-match press conference with, with Flanagan, but um, I would like to think that, that he was happy with a lot of the signs, a, a lot of the effort. Um but yeah, the the back end, that last fifteen minutes, so you know, we see, you know, DeBellin and, and you and eight can score within that last, you know, 15, 20 minute period. They were just out on their feet. They just had nothing really left. You had young Kurt Dillon on debut, who had to play some extended minutes. Joseph Paulo's not used to playing big minutes for the Sharkies. Um, but yeah, all in all, so it'll it'll be interesting to see what Mary McGregor takes away from that. Um, I think the big positives is there, there's one thing to have advantages when you're playing a team that is up against the ropes like the Sharks were in for that last 20 minutes. But then there's the other side of the coin to actually put a team away in that scenario. And I think you'll be very, very pleased that they did go on. Um, and, you know, whilst wasn't be disappointed leaking 20 points, um, putting 40 on the board, you know, no coach is, is ever disappointed putting putting 40 on the board. So, yeah, they, they go on to next week uh, and face the Warriors. So it makes for an interest, interesting contest uh, between those sides. Warriors obviously uh, losing their first match as we're about to cover off. But, yeah, you, you'd have to think um, come the end of next month we're, we're going to see a lot of uh, Dragons names tossed up thereabouts for, for starts um, in a sky blue jersey. And, and they are on that, that try scorers list. Paul Vaughan, Jack DeBell and Ewan Aitken, all three of those try scorers, you'd have to think would be pretty damn close um, to, to snagging a jersey. Uh, particular, the def- I can't see how Vaughan and DeBellin won't get a spot. You know, obviously, they're in, in rugby league. There, there's more positions available for forwards. If if you and Aitken didn't get selected, I, I could understand why. You know, um, center is a hotly contested position. Um, defensively, it is the hardest to defend, and then to ask someone um, to do that at the highest level because let's face it, the intensity is even higher than uh, most Test matches that you'll see. So, yeah. I found, um, yeah, their, their performance is thoroughly entertaining. It was good to see Widdop come back up onto the ball a little bit more. As I said in the um, reviews last week, uh, only five carries between both him and Ben Hunt. 
So it was, it was good to see him uh, really inject himself back in the game uh, and, and just play that uh, supporting role to, to Matt Dufty. And, and you can see it's, it's evidence within itself uh, what it does uh, for Matt Dufty when he, when he knows that the reliance isn't all on him. And I think that's the biggest positive that we're seeing, um, not only with a, with a side that's remaining fit. Uh, they've only used 18 players so far this season across the first six rounds, the lowest of any club. Um, and it just goes to show what, what consistency does. So, yeah, hats off to both. Yeah, again, really thoroughly entertaining. I'm not too sure on, on the extent of some of those injuries. So I'll probably cover off on, on a lot more of those once we get to know. You know, we're only fresh off the back end of this round. We haven't really heard anything as far as scans for, for any players. But, yeah, some, some more injuries to come in, in this next game that we'll cover off on, which is the, the Warriors and the Broncos. So the Broncos, the first side to, to knock off New Zealand uh, at home as well in front of a big um, Mount Smart crowd of uh, about 16,500. Uh, and look, it comes as no great surprise. No great surprise at all. The Broncos, when they run, they have success. Who would fucking have guessed? Who would fucking have guessed that if the Broncos just ran with conviction, controlled the middle early, and then even utilise some of their faster men within that, that they would have success. Oh, my God, rocket science. Um, you know, did, did we anticipate that they would have um, this sort of success this early on? Um, perhaps not. I, I don't think many people, I, I know I tipped the Warriors. Um, after seeing uh, Gillett ruled out, Nicarima ruled out, I actually liked the fact that um, Jack Bird was going to come in and force to play six because it meant he was just going to play on the ball. And that's what I've been crying for. You know, I was tossing up that he should probably play lock. Um, that's simply because it, it was a pretty apparent that there wasn't going to be any budging uh, between uh, Nick Arima or Milford in the halves from, from Wayne Bennett. But, yeah, to see him get his opportunities, you'd have to think um, that Nick Arima, if and when he does come back, uh, it, it may be off, um, off the bench in some sort of utility role. So, yeah, look, it, it wasn't, again to get back to the, the Broncos style of footy. It, it wasn't rocket science, but I think that's what they had been going away from, playing to their strengths. Um, and, and again, it goes to show that that contrasting halves combination. Once the, that Milford knew that Jack Bird, all he was ever going to really do was either A, dig into the line, or B, play out the back to... Um, to Darius Boyd to, for him to throw the last pass, which they had success with. Um, Jermaine Asako scored his try in the 62nd minute doing the, that exact thing. Uh, it allowed Milford to, I think, hone in on, on what he had to bring to the table. Because uh, they both him and Nick Arima obviously share similar attributes. Um, I think that Cody probably likes to play with a little bit more structure than what Milford does. Um, and... I guess the athletic attributes of, of Milford complement that, that eccentric play a little more than what, what happens for, for Cody. He's just, uh, he's a bit more traditional, even in his athletic ability. You know, it's, it's a big, big, strong step, but it's direct. Um, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know how he fits back into this side, whether he does come on at nine, but, you know, McCulloch's been playing comfortably. Uh, he's, he's easily been the Broncos' best um, across the, this first quarter of the season yet again. But I think the, the areas where the Warriors really started to lose some momentum was when um, Pulu got injured and when Ignatius Parsi went off after his first stint. So once uh, Bunny Afoa and then Mannering came onto the field, I just don't think they brought as much tenacity um, and punch into that line. And the, the Broncos definitely won that that initial 20, 25 minute battle of, of laying that platform up the guts and then playing to their edges. And that, that again was, was amplified when they did try to play too lateral too early. It, it stopped working for them. It broke down. We've seen a couple of plays there where the ball went behind Corey Oates and they had to go back and, re, and retrieve it. And, and another thing that to go back to the moves um, based off the injuries to um, Gillett and Nick Arima, we're seeing Tom Opacic back in the centres. I, I think he's got to stay there. I think at least for next week, you'd be mad to, to change that side. You've got to reward those players that went out and beat a team that, that will five in a row. Uh, that's, the, that's the mentality that I'd be taking. Um, 
perhaps dropping a, a forward off the bench if you did really want to um, keep Cody Nicarima in that side. But but other than that, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't really be changing anything. So, yeah, props props to the Broncos. Um, it was good to see them also bring the likes of uh, James Roberts into the middle to utilise him. And he had great success when, when he made that, that break. And uh, I can't remember who he ended up setting up. But, yeah, just that, that tackle bust up the guts. Um, was purely just off a, off a um, dummy half run in the centre of the field. So, again, it's about taking the game to the players that bring something to your side. And, and when that happens, that's when you're going to have, have the success. You, you can't have all this talent and not play to them. But at the same time, you have to play to them when it's most advantageous for the side, depending on the scenarios. And I don't think the Brisbane Broncos have really been doing that um, since that game against the Cowboys um, about a month ago. So... Yeah, expect them to, to gain a lot, a lot of confidence out of that um, and get back and, and continue on their winning ways. Alrighty, a game that, you know, I don't really want to have to discuss, but, you know, it's a part of uh, what I've decided to do when doing footy rants. Um, and it's the Cowboys' uh, significant loss to the Bulldogs, 27-10. And now I must be... Uh, Quite objective in, in the first half. If you actually look at things, um, you've got some some penalty goals given away. So there was there was three within the first 21 minutes. Okay, so that's that's a converted try equivalent. And then you've got um, Montoya's try in the 18th minute, which came off a rebound or ricochet, whatever you want to call it, off um, off Thurston's head. Uh, but then again, you know, I'll give give the raps to Hopawati. It was a great offload. Um, to, to Montoya to score that try, but again, you know, it was sort of sort of luck. Things are going their way, um, staffed of footy. So th- there's 12 nil. In my opinion, the only uh, actual well constructed points that the Bulldogs even scored was through for Tyler Mar- Mariner just before half time. That really dented the confidence, which was then compounded yet again uh, by Kieran Foran's field goal. Uh, right on the stroke of half time as well, which which left the scoreboard at 19 nil at half time. So fundamentally, we've really only killed ourselves with with poor discipline, and then there was that that one bad read, which if you look back on it, it's the exact same read that allowed kick out a score um, when they played Penrith. So you know, there's there's some some systems errors that are that are taking place on that edge all too often. Um, and I'm not sure why exactly they they keep rearing their head. Um, who's responsible? Who's lacking the confidence? Uh, because it's not like man, looking at that replay in that instance, it looked more like a lack of feel from the inside. And and Ethan Lowe was was marking his middle, which couldn't allow him. So he had to hold the middle, which didn't allow him to slide off onto Fatala Mariner to help uh, Michael Morgan get a body on him. So. Fundamentally, you have to blame the middle. That's that's where the Cowboys are, are losing all this. And, um, you know, Matt Scott's well below par. Some of the carries that Scott Bolton was taking were, were at 50%. Uh, it's, you'd like to give them an out and hope that there's perhaps some niggles. But every fucking team, every player's got niggles. It's not not an excuse at the top grade. I'm not sure, you know, Jonathan Thurston still doesn't look comfortable. But nothing was, was flowing. Um, Jake Granville has lost the... The running prowess that has seen him become one of the, the most loved and exciting dummy halves in the game over the last three or four seasons. Uh, Tamari Martin, because he's not a genuine nine, doesn't really offer up anything. They put Ben Hampton, who isn't a centre's asshole, out on that right edge in place of Javid Bowen. Um, and you can see the timing was off straight away. You know, Morgan's there, catch pass, trying to play deep in the line because they, they like to play deep to give Kyle Felt plenty of time so he can do his thing and, and dive in the corner. But he was too flat too often. Um, so th- there's got to be some culls after this week. There just has to be some change. Uh, no doubt Thurston and Morgan will take um, a whole heap of responsibility for the, the lack of direction. You know, the, the kick dead on the fall from Morgan, um, a couple of coughed up footies, but it was just stupid fundamental little errors um, turning over, coming out of trouble. They just kept giving the Bulldogs opportunities when when they didn't need to. And then coming into the start of the second half, but that first six, seven minutes, 
was all the Cowboys. There's absolutely no excuse. And then they just get caught with a footy digging into the, the left edge. So, uh, yeah, fundamentally, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know where the Cowboys really go from here. Um, but there, there has to be some change. There, there absolutely has to be some change. You, you can't come up with, with 14 errors, which is double the amount of your opposition, and expect the, the scoreboard to look any different. And again, it's, it's evidence of momentum playing against you. They actually ended up winning the penalty count 10-9, yet there's, there's four penalty goals against them. And, and this is a running theme. They're getting played out of the game too early on. You have to, you have to hold your discipline early on to, to give away the equivalent of, of a try within that first 20, but then not capitalise on anything else after the fact and then just hope that, that Jason Tamalolo is going to pull you out of trouble. It's not good enough. I know if, if Jason Tamalolo scores that try, I'm pretty sure it becomes like 12-6 or something like that, and it, and it becomes really, really interesting. But at the moment, it's quite evident that things aren't going your way. So those 50-50 plays, you have to turn those into more than 50-50 plays. And, yeah, it's it's hard to watch as a fan, but um, and it's hard to try not to give the dogs anything. But... Uh, one thing I will give that that effort play from from Adam Elliott I think is what um, especially like I said the Cowboys came out all guns blazing with all that footy for that first six or seven minutes and then they turn over the footy they give away a penalty and then Adam Elliott comes up with that effort play to to score that try and, and ultimately um, put put that margin to to twenty five nil and it just sunk the hearts of the Cowboys and. Yeah, I really think if the Cowboys could have scored before that Adam Elliott try, perhaps things change. Um, but but you can only keep going into these into the post match, like Paul Green has been with the attitude of like, oh, it's it's going to come, it's it's okay. We're, I'm still seeing improvement in these areas. The, the scoreboard doesn't fucking elicit that. And again, I know straight off the bat, let's take away those those twelve points, and and it's you still don't win. Ultimately, so let's let's take away those those disciplinary errors from start, and then that fluky try um, on that right edge for the dogs. They, they still don't win the game. So, look, I don't know what what happens from here for the for the Cowboys, but yeah, some some changes have to be made. Uh, I thought defensively, uh, Marshall King stood up quite well, but again, that they it was more so the Cowboys killing themselves for momentum that really prevented any pressure being built on those edges and getting out their halves. So, yeah, I'm not really going to harp on too much more about that. It was good game management by Kieran Foran to, to slot that field goal before halftime. You know, going into that halftime 19 nil down, I don't think there was too many people that, that would have really fancied themselves a, a winner in the Cowboys' sheds. So, yeah, moving on. <laughs> uh, Raiders' eels. Look, I'll be honest, this is uh, the only game that I didn't really watch over the weekend. Uh, I watched some of the extended highlights. Looked like a, a pretty wet and messy game uh, down in the nation's capital in Canberra. Uh, probably the, the two most out-of-form teams coming together, and it was Parramatta looking for their first win of the season. But, um, yeah, just it just never really amounted to anything. Like the scoreline of 18-2 in favour of the Raiders – it just shows that they're not even really hitting their straps. Uh, it, there were streaks, but, you know, that, that Rapana try, that's just lazy defence on behalf of, of Parramatta um, outside of anything. Uh, same again, sliding off someone like Blake Austin. We know he's a, a big runner of the ball, and, and it was great to see him score that, that and play in that fashion, that direct fashion, because um, I don't think he should have been dropped in the first place. I, I really believe that, and, and I, was, I was backing him week after week. It's a shame that he only really found his way into the side because of Sam Williams' injury. Uh, but, yeah, you've, I'm not sure what's happening, if there's something happening behind the scenes or what. But, yeah, in, in my opinion, he's, he's in your side every single week. Uh, and, again, Josh Papali. So it's good to see two two names on the try scorers list are guys that, that haven't been in that 17 consistently for the last little bit. Um, but, yeah, it just the, the poor old Parramatta Eels, they just look lost. Uh, they they never really mounted any attacking raids. Uh, there was there was lack of discipline. Like let's just go down and have a look at some of these um, stats down here. Like the, the completions in in wet weather. I'll give it to both sides. 
80% in conditions like that. Um, you, you can't complain uh, too much, but yeah, four line breaks to none. You know, when, when you've got players like Gutherson, French, and the like within your team, even Moses and um, Norman in the halves, to have a duck egg on that, that line break stat is, is really, really disappointing. Um, 42 tackle breaks in comparison to 24 tackle breaks for, for Canberra, you know. Any, like, tackle breaks is, is demonstrating to us second phase footy, right? So if you're playing wet footy and you're allowing teams cheap meters, that, that's just gonna make you more tired because you're doubling down on the meters that you're having to tidy up in and around the ruck. Um, and then again, like I said, I didn't really see too much. So um, penalties, penalty a thong, 26 penalties. Again, in, in shit weather like that, you need the game to be as fast as you can when you have the footy. So to, to give away 15 penalties uh, in, in Parramatta's terms, yeah, you, you can't really ask for, for much more. So I, I guess it's, it's a tick in the box for, for Ricky's boys. They're, they're back-to-back wins for the first time so far this season. I haven't really looked ahead um, too much more to see who they've got coming up in the, uh, the coming weeks. Let's see if we can just pull it up here. Um, might not even load for me. Yeah, I'll just scrap it. But yeah, if anyone wants to comment on there that's watching uh, who the, the Raiders have next week, that'll be interesting to see. Uh, on a Sunday footy, um, I was really looking forward to, to both these games, and they both ended up being uh, massive blowouts. Uh, Penrith Panthers was the first game um, at Pepper Stadium there. Uh, 35-12, they came out victors over the Gold Coast Titans. Interesting. It was an interesting game early on, uh, nice and tight. Uh, Copley scored within uh, the, about the first five minutes and, and set the pace. But then it was almost just a case of um, Penrith just needing to get in that arm wrestle a little bit um, and, you know, having to see in the first, what was it, first three games from this this side um, starting wasn't exactly their forte. But now I think the, the young forward pack is really starting to hit their straps, um, not to mention getting used to being steered around the field by none other than... Uh, Jimmy Maloney, who's had yet a fucking another wow of a game. Um, I, I don't want to buy into too much of the hype from the mainstream media who are all over him at the moment saying, you know, oh, he's a signing of the season. I think the last two weeks, yes, he's, he's definitely probably been the best player over the last two weeks in the NRL. But prior to that, he was playing some pretty ordinary footy behind Nathan Cleary. I thought he really struggled to, to find... Um, his little niche, what, what his uh, specific roles were, what value he's going to add to the Panthers, uh, much like um, Moylan is struggling. That's one thing I, I probably didn't really bring up in that Dragons-Sharks game. Um, Moylan, still just trying way too hard. So, yeah, uh, to get back to, to James Moylan, it was good to see him playing some footy. And, and when, when Penrith play with momentum and things are going their way, every single positive attribute of the 13 players that are on that field come into fray. You know, Peachy looked like he was a, a world-class 5'8 out there. It was funny, me and my mate Rhino, um, who, who popped off just not too long after the game started because they were talking up Peachy. Um, they were talking to Kevy Walters on Fox about, you know, whether they think he's a, he's a bang-up six. And uh, Kevy being a bit, a bit of the yes man that he is on, on Fox League was, um, you know, singing his praises. But... You know, I think that sometimes you just have to be objective about things. He's not really a very good six at all. He's just a great ball runner. And much like what we've seen with, with Jack Bird, when he was given his opportunities around the ruck once the, the game started to open up a little bit, um, of course they're going to look a lot better than, than what they may otherwise uh, bring to the table. So, you know, that's not to say that that's not a great trait um, and that not everyone can bring that to the table. But, yeah, I, I don't think it necessitate, necessitates uh, um, over-exaggerating uh, Peachy's ability in the sixth jersey. Um, Corey Harawira Naira, he definitely didn't let anyone down um, in his first start uh, for the, the Panthers this this year after coming off the bench for the previous five games. Uh, so Wonga Blake uh, being injured for this game saw Isaiah Yo move out to the centres and then Harawira Naira came into that starting side and then he finished with a double. Um, and how about um, Christian Crichton's uh, first try in the NRL. If you didn't catch the game, go back and watch the highlights. Absolutely outstanding. 
the body positions that some of these young wingers can get themselves into is is nothing short of amazing. Um, oh, yeah, it just just look at the highlights reel that the NRL has been able to create with their wingers over the last, let's say, three to four years versus the 10 to 15 before that. And I know, of course, it's because the, the corner post rule, no doubt. But I, I would really challenge as to whether the players of that previous era, era I beg your pardon, um, would have even been able to do some of those things. Just because athletically, they, they weren't really, they, they're not as athletic as, as the um, strength and conditioning programs and, and the like have been able to um, conjure up in, in today's game. So, yeah, thoroughly outstanding. Um, unfortunately, you know, the Titans just had some things, you know, it, it's, it pretty much said it all. During the warm-up, Morgan Boyle fucking knocks himself out with um, doing some contact warm-up with Bryce Cartwright. Um, and then you see Jai Arrow comes down with an injury. Ash Taylor goes off for a HIA, who then returns but doesn't really offer too much after that. Um, so, yeah, it, they, they just couldn't really continue to find that momentum. And then I think also missing um, Ryan James, Jared Wallace sort of felt like he needed to do things defensively that he otherwise wouldn't do. He was he was caught jamming in really, really heavily and was, was guilty of overeating the play at times. And, and I know, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures, but at the same time, if it's if it's at the expense of, of putting the other 12 blokes on the field under undue stress, uh, I, I think you've know, got to know when to pull it back. So, yeah, it was, it was a little bit disappointing to see um, some, some of those poor reads from, from a player like Jared Wallace, especially now he, he does have origin caps next to his name. Um, that, that expectation obviously uh, brings a lot of weight with it, especially with, the, the new coach Garth Brennan, he'll be he'll be disappointed with that. Um, but yeah, even even when the the Titans scored that try with about 20, 20 to go through Anthony Don, you just felt like Penrith just it was their little hiccup. They just had to recalibrate things and say, hey, what has actually been working for us? Okay, we just got to get back to that and, and away we go. So, and which they did, you know, after Anthony Don scores, they respond straight away with Harawira Naira's um, second try. And then, and then shut it out with, with Crichton's try. Nasty, nasty injury to um, Josh Mansour, uh, copying that flying knee, for, for lack of a better term, from Anthony Don. Um, so, yeah, suspected fractured cheekbone. So uh, they're two, two starting wingers, him and uh, Zelezniak, uh, out of the game at the moment. So it'll be interesting to, to see what uh, fresh new youngster comes in, um, ready for us to lay eyes on because there's – is there any club with a, with a better junior system than Penrith at the moment as far as uh, genuine chances to play NRL? Um, we, we see so many halves that are still banging on the door. You know, Luai, um, there's Egan, you know, Katoa got, got his, his first crack back up in, in first grade. They're, they're, they're just stacked for depth, but it's their local products. It's so cool to see. Um yeah, there, there should be more of it. I, I wish there were more genuine pathways, and it's shame being up here in Queensland uh, that, that there's just not that opportunity because we don't have the volume there. But, yeah, I would love to see more opportunities for, for juniors to thrive and, and create that pathway straight into the NRL. And, and I think um, Gus Gould's led club at, at Penrith there do that um, immensely, immensely well. On to the final game. So, yeah, haven't haven't long clicked off this game. Uh, the West Tigers, wow, what a, what a fucking out-and-out out thrilling performance. And if uh, anyone's going to stand up and say, I refuse to be dropped, it's none other than all hail the great legend Benji Marshall with a fucking two-try double. Um, yeah, so the Tigers, emphatic winners, 38 points to 12. And the Seagulls were, were just their own worst enemy. Um, I mean, I, I know I hammered uh, the, the Cowboys for some of their lack of discipline at times, but I don't think there was anyone worse with, with discipline coming out of trouble this weekend than the Manly Warringah Sea Eagles. Uh, j just across the board, everyone, everyone. You know, Travojevic was guilty. Uate probably had his worst game in a Manly jersey. We haven't seen him play that bad since he was back at the Knights before he was basically left to play that last 18 months of his contract in reserve grade before getting picked up by Trent Barrett. Um, yeah, they, they just couldn't find their, their way into the match. The, the Tigers played way too fast, way too direct. Um, 
Yeah, what more do you say? Like, we, and we, we've got to remember that Russell Packer's not even there. So Ben Madalino, he was just like, fuck it, I'll just double down. And he did exactly that. He was phenomenal. It was great to see him. Um, you know, we, we speak about the West Tigers at times being a, uh, a bit of a graveyard club. You know, years gone by, we've seen the likes of, of Blair go there. You know, Tapao's been there and never really amounted to anything. They, they sort of had to move on in order to, to renew their their careers. But uh, it, it just shows, you know, Brooks and Marshall, that they scored three tries between themselves. Um, and and they just – I love seeing – Six is past the seven, seven past the six. I love that shape, pulling a number. You know, it's it's such an art um, and it's something beautiful to watch as a as a student of the game when when they're analysing numbers on the run, as, as any good half should do, and, and picking out weaknesses within the defensive line. Um, if you didn't see, I, I'm not sure, well, it, it was in the Channel 9 coverage of this game. Uh, as before Benji's uh, second try. And it just shows that the top angle, um, you're facing Benji Marshall. So it was as if you were defending Benji. And it just shows his eyes. He spots Thompson in the line. And then, and then as Joey put it, he put, he put his mask on. And he's looked back outside. And as soon as he catches the ball, bang, right foot step straight in. And, and to see someone, you know, who showed glimpses in his time at the Broncos last year, uh, finished in the fashion at the Dragons that he did, uh, went at his stint with the Blues, which was a fucking catastrophe in rugby union. It's so good. You know, you always want to hear those those good news stories about those guys that have done so much for the game over the years. And Benji Marshall is definitely one of those those players. And um, it, it's so cool to see. And, and it was good to see Josh Reynolds uh, play his first game of the year. Uh, the poor bloke looked absolutely fucking gassed out there um played 30 minutes in the second half at dummy half uh but yeah you know it'll, it'll take him a little bit i think they'll keep bringing him off the bench um in that nine role to support jacob little uh and until benji marshall and luke brooks string together probably two or three losses um i can't see grub uh getting getting a look in that half's position at the moment so yeah really really crazy um and yeah I think I've just echoed what you already brought up there, Capo. Um, that yeah, Brooks, Brooks's. Um, it was it was interesting. Steve Roach in the Fox call. I've sort of changed between the calls because I get frustrated with both calls at times. Um, saying that you know this is Luke Brooks' side. He he sort of got overcalled when Moses was here, and I was just like, are you serious? Like, have you not watched the first six rounds? Like Benji Marshall is carving this side up, and I think it's his influence that's allowing. Luke Brooks, and it's probably more the maturity of Benji Marshall. You know, Luke Brooks looks at Benji Marshall and goes, oh, he's done shit. Like, he's a club legend here. I need to respect, but I'm also going to learn. And no doubt that Benji wants to give as well. And that's what's happening. It's being reciprocated. Whereas if you come up with the grades with Moses, you're you're constantly jostling for this. this, It's this power struggle. So now that 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 is completely dissipated and the fact that they're both in form – and he doesn't feel threatened that, oh, this could be a Reynolds-Marshall show, which is definitely a possibility. It'd be a fucking pretty random hearts combination, but it's not impossible. They're both there, so it can happen. Um, and I think that's what's bringing out the best in, in Luke Brooks. So, yeah, look, what a what a wacky round of football. Uh, my tips are still struggling. I, I tried as best I could to try and snag some upsets, and, and they didn't really come off. Um, so, yeah, what, what did I end up with? Um, I didn't tip the Rabbitohs, uh, I didn't tip the Dragons, I didn't tip the Broncos, I didn't tip the Dogs, and I didn't tip uh, the Tigers. So absolutely stinky. So if you're sitting here watching this looking for for, um, for tips, um, fuck off somewhere else because you're not going to have any success. I just like talking about footy, and if you like talking about footy, then we'll get along. But anything past that, as far as uh, multi-builders, um, yeah, fucking beat it. Go talk to William Hill for that shit. Um Anyway, gang, I, I'm keeping. I try to keep it pretty short and sharp. We're pretty well bang on the 45 minute mark. Uh, fingers crossed, coming into the back end of the week. So look for us again on, on Wednesday night. Hopefully, I'll have cut back in there, chewing the fat, um, and we'll we'll get things uh, back on track. But otherwise, yeah, I, I hope uh, your, your tips are a hell of a lot better than me. I hope you're, you're not supporting the Cowboys, and uh, perhaps perhaps you're a uh, 
a Dragons or a, a Warriors or Tigers, even Penrith fan, up the Penny Panthers. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop rambling. I'm just talking shit now. So, yeah, enjoy the start to your week, gang, um, and, and I'll hopefully see you uh, come Wednesday night uh, to preview everything round seven. Fuck, can't believe it's round seven already. Origin's just around the corner. Gee, I'm getting fucking hungry for Origin. Let's go. Footy Rance is out. Betty Matthews, see ya.